Hello, everybody. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Stephanie Cristello. I'm the Artistic Director of Expo Chicago, the International Exposition of Contemporary and Modern Art. It is my pleasure to welcome you all today to Dialogues, a symposium and a panel program that presents provocative artistic discourse with leading artists, architects, curators, and scholars on the current issues that engage them. Today, it is our great pleasure to be welcoming the Chicago Architecture Biennial, um, which is this year entitled, And Other Such Stories, curator Sapake Anjiyama, who will be convening a discussion with contributors of the third edition. The talk, entitled Black Utopias, addresses making space specifically black space outside the context of Chicago and more broadly within the United States and the African diaspora. In discussion, Anjiyama will be joined by photographer Akinbodi Akinbi, architect and activist Inam Kula, who cannot join us today but has contributed greatly to the discussion, artist Malose Mahashela, and artist and member of the Black Quantum Futurism Artist Collective, Rashida Phillips. Please join us in extending a very warm welcome to our panelists, and thank you to the Chicago Architecture Biennial for partnering with us on this discussion. Thank you. Um, thanks, Stephanie, and, and thanks for, um, for coming today. I, I'm actually going to start, instead of talking about black space, I maybe I'm going to talk about black time. Um, now, um, this term, black time, I have to say, is something that has maybe been something that uh, I would talk about, not necessarily in a public um, talk like this, in this public space. Um, it's something that um, it would be used as a kind of excuse, sorry, like, sorry, black people's time. Um, now, what does that mean, black people's time? Is there a notion of even um, a time which is related to a specific people? Now, coming into the context of Chicago and working on the Chicago Architecture Biennial, um, it became quite clear that the, the city of Chicago is made up of many cities. It's made up of many narratives and it's made up of many stories. Um, and even, actually yesterday, I spent some time with Melosa um, on the south side of Chicago because I wanted to show him many different initiatives and projects that have been taking place um, and, and actually really in relation to making space. And the reason it was important for me to show him these projects because I was interested in the way in which um, when I came to Chicago, what seemed like empty lots or empty spaces um, how they were being reconfigured, rethought through, and how that very much related to black space, but also black time. So I don't think there is a single definition here. Um, and that's why I may titled the talk Black Utopias? Um, but I wanted to think about this question with three practitioners and contributors to the biennial who have been thinking about these things for a long time. So I'm gonna start off by um, handing over to Akinbode Akinbi, <laughs> who's actually um, uh, a photographer that I respect very much, not only for his own practice, but also in the way that he is a pedagogue and an inspiration for other photographers and other generations. I actually got to know about Akinbode Akinbi's work um, because of a, a group, a Nigerian photography collective called um, Depth of Field. And they had an exhibition, I think it was in 2005, in South London Gallery. Um, and they all referenced you <laughs> as a kind of mentor who had helped them shape their perception of how they could describe um, their geography um, their space, their place, through photography. Um, and the, one of the conversations I had with, um, uh, with one of the photographers specifically was around how actually sound was actually related very much to the photography that he was making, simply because 
it was the sound that switched him on to, to work out what to photograph. So this in, interesting area of like the orality or oral space, time, and the visual, I think, are all connected. Um, so if it's OK, Akin Bode, I'm going to ask you to, I asked everyone to sort of uh, present five um, slides or oral pieces. Um, would you be happy to, to take it away? Thank you. Um, is it working? Yeah, I think it's working, yeah. Um, good evening, everybody. Thank you for coming. You can switch if you want to yeah, so um, if possibly show the images on a slow... Yeah, yeah that's the first image. Um, so, um, very subtly, because um, we, we're talking about black utopias, black time, black space, I'm very much concerned about these kind of things in a kind of very direct way, since I'm also a black person, but also um, indirectly as well, because I believe, or I would say as well, time, space, utopias are very much uh, concepts which are open-ended. Nobody or no people as such can give you a complete answer to these things. So um, my mode of working is to uh, wander, to meander, to um, try to navigate spaces. Uh, as um, Sepake just said, also sound is very, very important, of course, but also um, one aspect as a photographer is the light. So um, I meander, walk around, and as you can see in this particular image, this is of North London on the west side of the city here. And um, I had a very wonderful opportunity to um, meander this uh, neighborhood for about four or five weeks in June, July. And you can, if you want to, you can go and see some of the images at the um, Cultural Center, which are on show now during this um, three months of the biennial. Can we move to the next image, please? What's the next image? Yeah. So, um, it's, as I said, it's a kind of, um, it's, I try not to be very concrete. I mean, this is a very concrete image, but I try not to be very concrete. This image was actually made in Sao Paulo in Brazil. Huh? And you maybe, you can hope, to, you can see in the center of the image, um, the, um, is it called the Volkswagen, or um, I think that's the English word, way of saying it, Volkswagen bus. Huh? And this is a particular iconic um, bus all over um, Africa, actually, or, or especially in West Africa. It's used as a kind of taxi service uh, because uh, many of the countries in West Africa don't have proper public transport systems. So they are very much in private hands, and they use uh, many buses to transport people. Uh, sometimes can be very, very um, challenging because the buses are overfilled, uh, the, the drivers run um, or drive very fast to try to um, make as much money as possible in the shortest possible time. But this particular um, scene here is very much more in Sao Paulo, where they also have these buses as well, by the way, but not so much in the center, more in the suburbs or the outskirts of the city. And this is actually a graffiti. Yeah? So all the time, I'm trying to understand, um, listen in especially. I, I like saying this more than just looking huh, or perceiving. I try to listen in. So this listening in means actually using my physical body. So I listen with my ears, of course, but also with my, my actual body itself. Can we move to the next image, please? This is the again um, in North Londale. And what really interested me very much here is this other form of listening in the spirituality. So you can see two images of churches, actually. I think they were both boarded up. And um, I understood that many churches are formed in the, sub, uh, in, the, in the neighborhoods as a means of making money because sometimes you get some kind of tax relief and so on and so all kinds of funny stuff. Huh? So, but at the same time, these religions, Christianity and in other cases, um, even um, um, is, is Islamic um, religions, they actually tie us in the head. Huh? They, they give us a particular mindset. So people like to pray or like to um, believe in certain things, and it moves us away from trying to actually deal with the issues at hand. Huh? So like, for example, in North Londale, all the disinvestment and poverty and you know, um, gun violence and all this type, kind of stuff, huh? which I think could in some ways be solved through religious belief, but often is not. Actually, it actually in fact, encourages it. Huh? Next image, please. 
Yeah, so this again, I wrote, this is now in Lagos. Huh? And all these spaces you'll notice, more or less are trying to, um, it's not just actually black space, but it's a form of where we as um, human beings huh, try to occupy space. Huh? So this in um, particular is actually the beach and people praying huh? and, you know, quite f fervently. Huh? Some people go to the beach every day to pray. These particular people are usually at the weekends and Saturdays and Sundays. And you can see they're really into some kind of um, serious praying. Huh? And um, it's a kind of negotiation because somet sometimes they don't actually like to be photographed. In this particular case, they were so into their praying, they didn't really mind. And I don't force my presence on them. I try to, and if, if I understand that it's a kind of give and take, you can take or make the image. Huh? The final image, please. Yeah. So this for me is a very important image because this was taken in the city where I live at the moment, which is Berlin. And it's uh, um, what is called here a garden gnome, or in Germany, a garden um, dwarf. Huh? But it has a black face. Huh? So now I'm thinking to myself, why did this suddenly come? I, because I've been living in Germany for about the last 30, 40 years. But I mean, it's just a home away from home. I travel a lot. Huh? But I've never seen these kind of things with a black face before. So I did some research and found out they're not actually sold in Germany. They're sold across the border in Poland. Huh? And they become very popular in some particular areas of Germany as well, just across the border, right up to Berlin, which is not too far from the border. And again, this black face. Now, I don't know whether it's being abusive, being negative about black people, because in Poland, they also have a kind of black Madonna some, for centuries. Huh? So, but I just don't know why it suddenly became honor. And then um, other aspects in this image, I mean, this is part of my so-called um, artistic thing. Um, I included the um, ladder up. So this is a staircase to heaven. But for whom? The black people, white people, black face, white face. This is the kind of thing. Uh, I think I've said enough for the time being. Yeah. yeah, thank you. I mean, I think just knowing your work a little bit, there are some recurring um, elements that I just wanted to draw out. You, you always work in black and white photography, is that right? More or less, yeah, most times. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, is there, what is your kind of, yeah, what, what is your, why is that your preference? Um. <laughs> it's a tough question. Um, it's, it's very much a reduction away from the color. But I'm, I mean, I, I, mean I, I do accept color. I mean, I and also sometimes do take color images. But I prefer black and white because we don't have to deal with you know, the reds and the yellows and the blues and the greens and all this thing. But it's more this scale of the black to, to, um, through the grays to the white. Huh? And then it's very graphic. And um, for some, they, they, they get the image I'm trying to get across. Huh? For some, huh? not all. Huh? I mean, in fact, they, they are, I've met people and I've seen some people as well. They look away from black and white images because they, they, they're no longer think they're actual. Right? They prefer, much prefer the, black, the, white, um, the color images now of Instagram or, or in magazines and newspapers or on the television, of course. Uh, yeah, I was just, I would guess I was also asking about that insistence on using black and white because it becomes maybe a little bit more difficult to place it within time. Often we sort of see black and white images or sepia tone images as something that relates to something that comes from another place or time. And I know your practice over a period of time has been addressing and looking at um, African diaspora um, in relation to the urban environment. So I, I just wondered for you, in your photography, um, what, are those, what are those places of markers of time when you look at your sort of practice over the breadth of time? What are those markers of time in relation to your, your visual work? Time is a very um, difficult topic. <laughs> it's a fact. Um, the other morning I woke up with the realization that yesterday is already today and is tomorrow at the same time. So there is, I mean, we are brought up like this uh, to believe there's a kind of linear, you know, yesterday and I'm coming tomorrow. But actually, it's, it's an elliptical movement and we are constantly moving and actually in the present and the here and now. Huh? And depending on one's personality and how you've been brought up, of course, some people are very fixed. 
on the past or the present or what's going to happen in the future. But the most important, I think, is actually living in the present. And then again, in photography, <laughs> it's even more complex because we're constantly taking away fragments of, of the present. Huh? And immediately, a photograph becomes the past. Huh? At the same time, it can also sometimes point out towards the future. So I mean, there's so many aspects in this. Um, I think I read uh, about a photographer, um, yeah, it was Lee Friedlander. And he took a photograph in 19, 2010 of um, Trump, an image of him in New Yorker. Huh? And he was pointing and saying this, uh, something about going to be the future. Now Trump is the future. So this kind of thing. I mean, in some ways, it, again, it's a very personal thing. If you are sensitive to yourself, you understand what has happened yesterday or in the past. You try to understand what's happening now, and you can sometimes perceive what's going to happen in the future. So again, talking about um, black time, black space, black utopias, eventually you might be able to conceive, perceive a kind of utopia in the future. But I mean, again, I think it's very personal. I mean, so I, <laughs> I'm not a missionary to sort of say which way it's going to go. I think you have a last image. Did you want to tell us about it? Or? Oh, I'm sorry, I, I forgot about this image. This is a, actually quite a sad image. So this was during um, my work in North Lawndale in June, July. And I did some workshops with um, younger, um, I like to call younger colleagues, students, um, school um, children, but also some adults as well. We were walking around, and one particular um, uh, older adult, I forget his name, unfortunately, if, uh, in fact, a, um, a war veteran, a Vietnam War veteran, pointed this um, statue out to us in one of the smaller parks in North Lawndale, and the head of the father is missing. So he said this is a kind of symbol of um, what's happening to a lot of African Amer American communities, that the male figure, the head is gone, it's no longer there. So many um, families grow up without the actual, the man actually being there or you know, being um, absent. So it's the mother and the children who have to more or less deal with the situation. So I took this particular, in fact, I went there two, three times, and this particular day again, the light, and also this tree in the background is actually dead. So it's standing as some kind of sculptural um, memory. So going back into the past. And then, um, yeah, it's, it's, it was a very sort of basic sculpture, nothing special to look at, but still. So this is the kind of thing, all the time I'm trying personally now to understand actually what is happening to us. Us being, I mean, okay, you know, Africans, African Americans, black people, black space, black type, black, but also, no, not just that, everybody. Okay, I'm gonna come back to you just in this question of uh, the listening body and the resonant body. I think it's something that will probably connect a little bit with Melosa. But in relation to this question of time, I think Rashida, it makes sense to kind of move on to you. Um, what would you like to share with us today? Uh, is there a clicker yeah, I can use? I, can, I think it's this <laughs> very retro future looking okay. <laughs> device. <Cool. laughs> um, what do I push? Okay, all right, great. Hi everybody, um, my name is Rashida. I am one half of the um, collective black quantum futurism. My partner is in Norway right now. Um, more mother. Um, we, our collective um, focuses on, I mean, it's, it's pretty much exactly <laughs> what it says it is. It comes, it, it's, it's a practice and, and artistic practice and theory that's developed out of the Afrofuturism tradition, um, where it's taking this notion of the Afro being applied to the future um, as something that modifies the future substantially. So when we apply the Afro to the future, what does that mean? What does that, how does that change the temporal domain of the future? And for me, that, that involved going back and um, really thinking about what time looks like in these Afro-diasporan traditions. Um, and what that looks like is, is much different from the sort of linear tradition that we, that's been ingrained in us um, in Western societies where um, past, present, and future is sort of bifurcated. They don't, they don't 
talk to each other, they don't connect. You can never like kind of get back to the past. The past should be seen as dead or as something that doesn't you know, Im impact you. And then the future is something that we can never like arrive into. We're always constantly moving through the present. Um, so just thinking about those things and how those things are connected to legacies of colonialism, connected very specifically um, to legacies of slavery um, and, and all of these things that I, I won't have time to go into today. But I have a bunch of books and I have a bunch of um, a bunch of uh, essays that are online, and also um, the Funambulist, which is also a contributor to the um, to the Biennale, um, has a essay of mine that's in that book about space and time and the connections therein. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that and just um, reference the project that we did in Philadelphia called Community Futures Lab, which is installed here, um, and a, a version that's um, for Chicago. Um, and this project came out of um, essentially, so I'm also an attorney, and for about 10 years I practiced um, representing people who were facing loss of their homes through um, either a mortgage foreclosure or um, most recently I, I spent five, or seven years um, representing people who were facing eviction and doing a lot of policy work around those issues as well. Um, and in particular, looking at the issue of um, the lack of representation, in particular of black women in eviction court that causes them to lose their homes and causes them to lose homes well into the future because of the records that come about from evictions. And in particular, I live in North Philadelphia, um, which is, is a, um, one of the, Philly in general, one of the things that you should know is that it's the largest poor city in the country. Um, and so with that comes a lot of issues, and in particular, a lot of poverty is concentrated in this one area um, called North Philadelphia. And so I live in North Philly. Um, we also do a lot of work there um, in the community. And one of the things that was happening is that the government um, the, and the Philadelphia Housing Authority was taking 1,300 properties in North Philly by eminent domain, which means that people pretty much didn't have a say in it. They came and said, hey, we want to redevelop this area. Um, we got a bunch of money from HUD, and we're going to come in and take all these houses from you all and not give you the proper value for them. And then in doing that, um, if you could play this video, um, I don't know how to play it right here. Um, they demolished the public housing. All right, I don't know what's happening. So if that plays, um, they demolished the public housing in that area, um, which was these housing towers that had stood since the 1960s, and in doing so, um, displaced about 400 families through that project. And then when in doing that, that redevelopment of that area, which is a rapidly gentrifying area and, and all sorts of things happening in that area, um, they, um, like I said, displaced a bunch of families. But the narrative that was attached to this um, was just really, really disgusting, really. So when you kind of look up what people were saying or what the government was saying about why they were justifying taking this property, they were really blaming it on the residents. They were saying, oh, it's crime ridden. This, this, um, the, the housing authority president has this one narrative, this one story that kept coming up. Like every time I went to visit these housing projects, I was held at gunpoint, like all this stuff that sound like it didn't actually happen. Um, but again, these narratives being used to justify taking this property and redeveloping this area, which was already rapidly gentrifying and, and connected to a uni Temple University. Um, so they demolished these towers. And part of um, what happened in, in, in us thinking about this, we, we created this project called Community Futures Lab um, to be able to kind of um, have a space for people to grieve and, and think about, the first grieve what was happening. So, even though these housing towers were seen as like a scourge on the community as public housing usually is, right, and, and especially um, these high rises, right, that are associated with a lot of negative things. Um, but when you, unfortunately the video is not playing, but when you hear, the, when you see the buildings coming down, you hear people cheering, um, which is really disturbing. But then if you're there, what you actually see is that there's residents around crying and like really grieving um, what's happening to this building. So we started this project, Community Features Lab, to think about those things and, and um, think about how memory and space and time are all tied together and how communities come together to not only um, you know, create space, but to create time together and what that means. Um, and so what that meant for this community in particular that was cut off from the future um, of this community that was set, you know, where the government said, hey, this is our vision for the future of this community. This is what we're going to come in and do, and we're not going to ask you. We're going to give you two meetings to come and express how you feel about this happening, but we're not going to really care. You know, at the end of the day, we're going to do what we want to do. Um, so we started the lab um, in order to um, do what we called oral futures interviews with people. So that's both like recovering this memory of the past, recovering all the like really amazing things that had happened in that community that was, again, being cut off from this 
narrative about why this redevelopment was happening. So this community is, is really amazing. It's called Sharswood. Um, a lot of civil rights activists um, lived there. Malcolm X stayed there for a couple of months. Muhammad Ali practiced at a gym that was there. There was this amazing jazz club that was there. All of this stuff was demolished or just not talked about and just like really left out of the narrative. So the whole point of the like oral futures was to be able to recover those memories, but also for people to be able to speak into existence what they wanted to see happen and to be able to amplify that through, through the policy work that I was doing as, a, as an attorney for that community. And so part of the project was just also doing a lot of research on the area and kind of like documenting the redevelopment as it was happening, both to like be able to hold them accountable as it was happening over this like 10 year stretch of time that the redevelopment was supposed to be happening. And then like as, a, as an attorney, like part of my job was to like ensure that there were policies that protected people and gave them the ability to come back. But what happens when you're doing a project like that over 10 years period of time, right? Um, people who are low income, their time is not the same. Like 10 years to them means something very different um, than 10 years from someone who's wealthy or someone who's able to, you know, maintain their homes for, for particular reasons. Um, so one of the things that I, I like to do is like look on Google Maps and see how it changed over time as this redevelopment was happening. Um, so these things like are being covered up. I love catching like Google in their own <laughs> um, thing, um, surveillance. But and then these are the new houses that they're building. They're building these like $500,000 um, townhomes in place of the public housing. And so that's one of the public housing towers that's remaining there um, that they're going to leave up and then build these houses all around it. So it's really interesting to see um, how Google documents the neighborhood change. Um, these are some of the questions that we asked um, as a part of the project, um, the oral futures questions. And again, really being able to privilege um, people's visions of the future who have been left out of that conversation and then to translate that, amplify that through, through various policy initiatives that I was doing. Um, and then also to just like document the joy of that community, like not just focus on this narrative of, of, of gentrification, displacement, trauma, which is also there too, but that these things exist alongside of this community thriving and trying to survive and like um, coming together every summer to have this, this community um, uh, uh, picnic and cookout and things like that. Um, you know, it was really important for us to also share those things. Um, it was really important for us to um, think about mapping. And so the essay that I was talking about that talks about space and time and how those two things are connected, um, we did a lot of memory mapping with people, um, especially as all of these buildings are being demolished and, and, and being taken away, the memory goes with it, right? Um, so being able to like privilege people's memories of, of you know, wh what was their experience or wh what's a memory that's stimulated by a particular place. Um, and so thinking about, again, how maps kind of fuse space time and, and, and um, bring those two things together. Um, a few more slides. Um, this is, um, so the Community Futures Lab physical location was only for a year because we only had funding to do it for a year, but we continue to work in that community. We live in that community. Um, we continue to work with, with the community members and the community leaders um, to document what's happening in that neighborhood. And so this is going to be a platform um, and on which people can add their own memories and, and do some mapping of, of the neighborhood. And again, um, you know, when we think about maps, we often think of them as objective, right? Um, we think of them as, as actually representing the territory, but as we know, like there's, there's layers here, just what you see on a map is, was created by somebody who had a, a certain objective in mind, and so they're never, maps are never objective, and so really teasing that out and making these maps um, um, something that we can intervene in. Um, and so some of the things that are on the map you know, like the demolition of, of the towers, um, you know, but also asking people to document where they see um, things being erased or, or where they have memories and things like that. So this is gonna be an online platform. Um, so I'll just go through, I got a couple more slides. So the last thing I wanna talk about real quick um, as it relates to, to this notion of space and time and utopias. Um, one of the things that we found um, when we were uh, doing a lot of research on a neighborhood was um, this um, Reverend Leon Sullivan who, who actually did a lot of work in South Africa and, and really around the world around various issues. But he was based in North Philly for a time. And during that time, um, he, he ran a church called Zion Baptist um, Church. And him and his church members did so many just like these black futurist liberation projects back in the 1960s that, are, that were just really incredible. So one of the things they did, um, there was a, um, a housing site in the neighborhood in North Philly that was discriminating against black people. 
him and his church members went and bought that housing site and said, you're never going to discriminate again because now we own it. And it's now, it's still run as affordable housing. Like they got money from HUD and they, they ran it as the first black owned affordable housing project in the United States, right in North Philly. They started a, um, one of the first black owned shopping plazas that still stands today in North Philly. And then one of the most amazing things is that they built a black space agency right in the middle of North Philly um, called Black, um, called um, Progress Aerospace Enterprises that built parts, um, space parts for NASA. And Leon Sullivan said specifically, and, and he started this company about two weeks after Martin Luther King died um, during, the, during the time of the space race in 1968. And he said, I want to see something on the moon that a black man made. And that was his, that was his motivation for creating the space company that employed um, young, unskilled um, black laborers from the community, trained them, and had them building parts and weapons. It was not without controversy um, for NASA. So it was really cool. And just this, again, this idea of space, like literal outer space and, and the space race on the ground and how these two things were connecting around the Fair Housing Act and around, um, around the space race um, 50 years ago. And so we did an exhibition that, that um, dig, dug up the archives. We like got a bunch of Ebony, Jet magazines, all of these things that talked about the space race um, during the 1960s and black people's involvement. So there was a poor people's um, campaign march that happened at Cape Canaveral. Like we were really involved in this, both protesting it, both fighting for fairness, um, in terms of hiring, in terms of, um, so when NASA, um, NASA was trying to, was a part of the space race, they were actually gentrifying and pushing people out of their neighborhoods because they were building housing, subsidized housing for their employees. And so just all of these things that were, were converging um, during the 1960s. And um, so yeah, that's it. But yeah, that was part of the project. And um, one of the things that um, we did when we did that exhibition was we held a forum for youth um, homeless and, and housing and stable youth to talk about what does youth homelessness look like? What is the future of housing for youth? What's, what does housing look like that where youth are held and youth are protected and safe and thriving? Um, and that was just a really amazing event because it just, it, you know, kids have the answer. Ultimately, the youth have the answer. They are the future. They know what these things look like and how they're impacting them, but they're not being heard. Um, so we really wanted to have a space where they felt heard um, and listened to. And so um, the Community Futures Lab that's here um, has some of these elements in it and, and it's really going to be specific to Chicago. It's a self-activated space that we want Chicago's voices to be here. We don't want to be some artists jetting in and being like, hey, here's our project. This is cool. Like, this is not about us. It's not about Philly. It's, it's about, it's for you all um, to be able to just put this kind of Afrofuturist lens on this, on this thought of gentrification and using these new languages and new terms and new constructs to kind of deal with these old problems um, that have been going on forever, but right, we're, we're using the same stale language to attack these problems. So really thinking about these things through an Afrofuturist or black quantum futurist lens. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I think one of the things I wanted to ask you about was um, within your project, how do you create a sort of collective vision of the future? Because you kind of talk about a community future. So um, within that idea, it's not necessarily one idea's perspective of what a community might look like in the future, but it's maybe a more collective vision. Could you tell us a little bit more about what kind of, you know, strategies you use to kind of create a kind of more collective or community vision? Yeah, so at the Community Futures Lab, um, we did um, workshops like maybe two or three times a month um, that were about different topics. We had um, some things called housing futures workshops, which were both constructed as giving people information about housing rights and housing policy issues, but also giving them an opportunity to voice their concerns and voice um, their opinions and, and thoughts and suggestions about what should happen. And so in that process, like we always talked about you know, we, we tried to get away from this, uh, these kind of like white supremacist constructs about everything has to be in agreement, everybody has to come to an, a consensus. Um, like, no, the, the, the struggle is, is the process. And so really privileging that process of struggle, um, you know, part of one of the things that this project was a year long is because it, 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 this, this piece of the project, because we needed to establish that like connection to the community, again, like, we weren't trusted automatically, even though I live a couple blocks from where this was happening. You know, I had to understand and recognize what my privileges were, that I was a lawyer, that I, I have a home, you know, I own my home, all of these things that the people that I was interfacing with may not have those privileges. So like kind of recognizing that and really taking the time, like time 
was we took that very seriously. We took people's temporalities very seriously. And so when they walked into the space, like we never did a workshop where, you know, you had this show up on time and then if you didn't show up on time, you couldn't get anything out of it. We, we did what we called walk-in workshops and constructed them so that at any point that you're walking in, you're able to join into the discussion and you're able to add your voice into it. And then so one of the things that came out of this um, that um, if there's a short video that's like five minutes that's up in the Community Futures Lab that talks about the trajectory of the project. But one of the things that came out of this was that um, from the Housing Futures workshops, we um, created housing signs and got city council to hold hearings on um, the eviction crisis that was happening in the city. And so um, 22,000 eviction filings each year, only 5% of the people going to eviction court had, um, had a lawyer. And so through that initiative, um, and, and this is people's voices saying, this is what we need. We need lawyers. We need to be able to be defendant when we're walking into court. We're all losing our homes. Um, we were able to get $500,000 to um, in, increase the number of lawyers who were um, present in eviction court to be able to represent people for free. So that was something that came out of this. Like it, it um, you know, that was one like kind of discrete problem, but just the whole notion of like, again, um, we have to struggle together, there's tension, and that's okay. Not this like kind of like everything's gonna be tied up with a neat bow or like we're gonna be able to stop this gentrification from happening or stop this redevelopment, but like a more realistic sense of like how do we survive through this um, in very practical and immediate ways? How do we kind of deal with some of these crises in immediate ways? And so that's why I'd like the, the, the question of a utopia is really interesting to me because I don't believe it exists. I don't believe it can exist because everybody's always gonna have, if someone's desires cuts against somebody else's desires, that immediately ends the utopia and so this this idea um, you know there's other kind of ways of, of thinking about community um, a lot of things that we can learn from afro diasporan and indigenous communities about how we struggle together how we create time together how we create space together um, in ways that we exist and survive into these futures and, and back and through the past um, there's other other ways to lean on other things to, to to think about there. Um, and even thinking about like the notion of archives, like for me it was really interesting how um, this community is right next to Temple University which has all of this archives, amazing archives about this neighborhood. Nobody can access it. Nobody knows how to go to Temple University and get into the archives and they're not gonna be able to take the time to do that. Um, so this idea that people are cut off from their past um, that's right next to them, spatially located a couple blocks from them, they still can't access it um, is, is a really key thing when we're thinking about how communities can, can build time and together access their past to be able to change their futures or, or create futures for themselves. I don't know if that answers the question, but. No, I mean, yeah, but it's but a great answer in any case. I mean, I'm, I'm also just interested in, you know, what you just said there in terms of if you don't be necessarily believe in a, in a utopia. I wanted to kind of, but also you related that to not being able to access a history or a heritage or, or an archive. Um, and so not necessarily knowing you know, a kind, of, um, a kind of trajectory, you can't necessarily reach a kind of another dimension, let's say a future dimension. So um, I guess one of the things I'm kind of sort of thinking about is whether this idea of a utopia is always something that should, should not necessarily be possible, should always be maybe out of grasp, like not necessarily to be able to be reached, but I think I'm also interested in you know, can it even be imagined? Because that's that's where I think um, politically and socially at the moment, it's very difficult to maybe collectively imagine something differently together. Um, so I'm just, I guess I'm curious as to, uh, as to why you think you needed to use your kind of artistic skills in black quantum futurism to, to aid your, you know, your lawyer, your, you know, your professional um, kind of role in supporting the development of thinking about um, housing? Why? <laughs> I guess it's a very long question for saying why. Yeah, <laughs> I can't help it. I think, um, you know, I, I, for me, it's really important. Um, I became a lawyer before I became an artist or, or recognized myself as an Afrofuturist. But as soon as I came across Afrofuturism as a, as a concept and as a community, it immediately made so much sense to think about that in my legal work um, and to find ways to bring those things together because ultimately what my work is as an attorney when I'm representing somebody in eviction court, when I'm doing policy work, it's about time. It's about trying to get my clients more time um, in, in their homes. It's about tr trying to get my clients um, more time to transition into a place that's safe for them. It's ultimately about time. 
Um, and it's ultimately about my ability as an attorney to manipulate time for them against this system and to use my skills and use my privileges to be able to do that. Um, so that's how I started to think about that. And I, 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 for me, I was never interested in Afrofuturism as a like a art thing or as a, you know, I was interested in as a tool for speculation, as a tool for empowerment, as a tool for um, expanding um, the temporalities of, of my clients who are often cut off from their futures or often constricted to these very small temporal bands as they, you know, have to survive from day to day. Um, so I was interested in thinking about how Afrofuturism expands that, that, that space. And then Afrofuturism had a lot of limitations to it itself. So for me, it was like, I, I have to go beyond that to really, to really think about this temporality. So for me, my art is in service to my community engagement and my community work. Um, it's never something that's on its own. And f of course, it's also personal and it's also something I feel compelled to do, but it's always for me in service of, of this kind of greater thing around community engagement and, and yeah, so. Yeah, thank you. I think that's a great segue to move to Melosa in relation to thinking about how practice is in service to a community or engaging with space or the making of space. Um, how do you want to, do you want to introduce yourself, Melosa, in terms of, or do you want to go straight to the audio? Um, I mean, <laughs> can we just jump into the, you can play whichever one, I'll just tell you when to stop. You can turn it up if you want, yeah. I For us, the people of South Africa, our cause of action is very clear. We must fight back. The path of compromise that has been taken by the traitors and puppets is not open to us. The path of surrender and subservience is also not open. It is foreign to us. There is only one path and one path only. It is the path of relentless struggle. It is the path of sacrifice. It is the path of war and glory. What is today happening in South Africa has been happening throughout the years. We have been murdered in cold blood by Pretoria's police thugs. Our children have died of malnutrition in the Bantustans while food was being destroyed to maintain high prices. The wealth of our country has gone to make a minority white population as well as foreigners to regard our country 
as one of milk and honey while we starved and died. They have murdered us in numerous ways, not only just physically but even spiritually, through their inferior education. It is a measure of the resilience of our people, their refusal to surrender, that even today the battles are raging in our country. The war of liberation continues and it is intensifying with each passing day. The time has come for us to acquire weapons and to pay the white minority regime back in its own coin. We cannot die alone. We cannot bury alone. Pretoria has carried its murderous campaign to extremes. We must now respond to the reactionary violence of the enemy with our own revolutionary violence. The weapons are there in White Houses. Each White House has a gun or two hidden somewhere for use against us. Ah, you can fade out. Our mothers work in their kitchens. We work so, my name is Milo Sam from Johannesburg, South Africa. And then we, me and my partner, we started an organization called Kelegetla Library. We've been doing so since we were still students, um, creating spaces of discourse and discussions, uh, screenings, um, all these things that you can imagine, um, artistic output, just basically a process of expression. Um, and then when we graduated, um, we sort of professionalized ourselves. So we've been doing this te technically around like 15, 16 years. Um, from, from 2006, seven or so, we moved in one of these infrastructures, um, which was built in 1904. Um, it's called the Drill Hall. It was made famous for the 1956 treason trial of South Africa, uh, where Nelson Mandela, Gavin Beke, Walter Susulu, uh, Joe Slovo were, so were sort of one of those uh, amongst 155 or 56 other people that were collected across South Africa to be trialed there for drafting the Freedom Charter. Uh, those who don't know, the Freedom Charter is that like listing which was put together and then they will go to each village, each neighborhood across South Africa collecting demands um, which they will pose um, um, or sort of put together to propose to the apartheid regime at the time to say, you know, um, everybody shall have free housing, everybody shall have, uh, you know, um, free education or access to education and it goes on and so forth and so forth. So the apartheid regime saw that as, as, as a form of over overthrowing the government and obviously it's treason. Um, we operated in that space up until 2015 and we moved out. We took an ethical exile because that space is quite complicated and complex. The neighborhood is intense. Uh, we based in the inner city of Johannesburg. Um, so, I mean, the audios I just paid for you guys, I just wanted to go back to basically probably the question of, um, of, of, of black utopia or black spaces. And for me, I believe that they are very temporary and black utopia is just, a, is just um, sort of um, an illusion or some form of safety net that we have just to say, oh, we can come together and really, you know, um, create this thing that will propel us into the future. Uh, but I believe in the here and now. Basically, as my heart beats right now, I believe in this time that I exist in and in the kind of capacity or the kind of, um, you know, sort of strength. I don't know how to frame it, but, you know, what you do now will echo forever. And then what was in the past is in the past. So it's either we, we how do we sort of, you know, capitalize on this existence of, of, of the now. So I just believe in the now. And then the idea of anything in the future might not be, in, be here in the future. And then those who were in the past, what they wrote or what they professed, even Nelson Mandela and many others, is they didn't achieve it to the totality. They only achieved what they could achieve. So it's, it's also my continuation. I, I'm not going to say I'm continuing anything from the past. I'm continuing, I'm continuing from where I am and how the future is going to go. So the audio I just played right now, one of them um, was from Radio Bantu. Radio Bantu was this radio station which was created by the apartheid regime, which controlled and censored every material that's going to go out into the public. 
and then within their mandate was to send uh, different kind of recording vans to different villages from Polukwani all the way to Kosa Land in Cape Town uh, to document this sonic, this music. But at the same time, they will screen that music before it gets played. If it's positive, if it's about gathering, if it's about this, the, uh, the LPs or the vinyls will be scratched. So then the DJs will play certain specific sounds. Then the other one, which was more of an utopia, um, which was Radio Freedom, which was the second one about more like, you know, fighting back. And then that space it was in a sense a radio, it's called Radio Freedom. And that radio was created as a counter narrative to Radio Bantu. And then that space was more where black people can really talk of their vision, talk of their goals, talk of where they're going to meet next, what's going to be the next mission, the sonic, the music they're going to play there, it's some of the sounds which, which is like, you know, more political and more direct. Um, but then I just want to clarify also in the sense that these two spaces were separate from who gets to listen to what. Radio Freedom, you couldn't listen it in public spaces. You'll get seven year sentence if you, if you get caught of listening to that. So most of the time it was broadcast outside of South, South Africa. Tanzania was one of those, I think, uh, and many others. So my, my thing is, is also when we, talk of, when we talk of black utopia, anything black, we have to be careful how we discuss it and where we, we get to discuss it. Well, how does information get to, you know, um, who gets to listen to that information and how do they get to build into that information? Sometimes I believe like when we talk of anything black, we need to somehow, you know, change the language a bit. Even the language I'm speaking in, I'm not comfortable in speaking in, in that language. That's why then the first track from Radio Bantu, it was a Shangan uh, track. I can't even decipher to you, to you guys uh, the lyrics. But it's like, how do we get to translate? How do we get to speak amongst ourselves without really speaking such a public space when we talk about utopia? Do we go underground to do that? Or do we, do we uh, what forms and ways do we create or spaces do we create to really discuss amongst ourselves and really decipher the language also to break away from this sort of um, easily accessible um, uh, tone of language that we, every time we talk of, of blackness, it has to be in such a, in such a way that it can be easily grasped and manipulated in different ways or forms. So I like this idea of, of sometimes when we talk, it would be nice if we talk in a hidden, in a hidden you know, curtain uh, without broadcasting constantly um, what we're thinking, uh, what's the next move, what's the next gathering, what's the next plan, or all this kind of thing. So it goes, it's, I guess it goes back to, to I mean, to the idea of, um, You know, uh, do we even trust, do we even, I mean, the idea of trust, um, I mean, you can ask me a question from there, I guess I'll unravel my thinking, but most of the time it's like, is how do we get to discuss ourselves in certain spaces that really allow ourselves to be free and really allow ourselves for me to break away from such const constantly of speaking in English and then how do we even reframe ourselves in speaking in a, in a quite a different tone and or narrative or way that is much easier to, to to translate to the people who need to hear the message, you know? I mean, I think, yeah, I mean, all three of you have touched on the kind of the resonant body or the listening body and how in ways um, you, you are either receptors or receivers of whether that's like a visual reception or whether that's like a sonic reception um, or whether it's actually on a, on a level of legality, a kind of listening, a hearing, uh, you know, being audible or being heard. I think in relation to the idea of being clandestine or, do, I mean, I don't know if you mean like secretive, you mean actually hidden, right? Not secretive, but amongst, amongst the community itself. It's much easier to translate your thinking amongst the community itself. Never, it, should, it shouldn't be as like we're always in the sick, we're never secretive because we've always been watched. We've always been watched. No matter whichever mediums you use, we've always been watched. So it's never the idea of being secretive, but it's a matter of, of, of where, if you're going to propose or pose such a question as Black Utopia. And then you find yourself, you're still talking of utopia, but you're not in an utopia space. So the comfortability of just, you know, saying these things. So it's a matter of, you know, putting the black body in such a context to speak about certain things. It's, a, it's always this kind of, you know, for me, it's always like this, um, this, this challenge. I mean, I think that's what I was relating to when I said at the beginning about black people time being really a joke among people who are close and it's not something that you would necessarily share 
publicly. But I think I've found that we're in a, in a particular moment where um, it's really important to be able to discuss what's happening within our cities um, and not necessarily within only within a smaller um, community, but actually also how do you create a voice which is um, needed to be public in order for change to, to, be, ma to be made or to happen. So um, this is why I was kind of asking you, Rashida, about the kind of collective voice or the collective vision, um, because I don't believe it can be on, a, on the basis of an individual, but it has to be on a kind of collective or uh, on a collective voice, basically. Um, I just wanted to come back to you, Akimbode, because you spent like a month here in Chicago and you had been, um, before previously you hadn't been to Chicago, but you had obviously some ideas of what Chicago um, would be like. I have to also say that for a number of contributors, they'd never been to Chicago before, but they knew so much about it before coming here. Can you just say a little bit about what your kind of maybe idea or imagination of what Chicago would be like and maybe how that was met or not met in your relationship to being here? So, um, interestingly, I, I've heard a lot about Chicago and seen a lot of images, because um, pho photographs especially, especially since the Second World War, because they had some very good um, photography schools here in Chicago. Huh? And I looked at the work, and so I had a kind of um, idea of what, what to expect. Huh? And then um, I tried to be as open-minded as possible. So I came here with no particular expect, uh, um, expecting anything. I just tried to be open. I mean, I did, of course, I did some research I knew what, more, more or less what to expect in North Lawndale or in the south side, the west side, but also in downtown as well. And um, I hit the ground running, so I immediately got into the, um, into the groove. Um, one thing which I found very upsetting was almost everybody told me at the very beginning, my first few days, Chicago is a very segregated city. And I saw this as well. I mean, yeah, you, you actually see this. Huh? At the same time, and this was also experience as well, that um, Midwesterners are very friendly people. I would agree on this point too as well. And um, it's, 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 a kind of, it's this kind of almost schizophrenic situation where in the downtown area, there's a kind of um, vibe which is very sort of open-ended. Yeah? Around six, five, six in the morning, people start coming to work. The, the downtown gets buzzing around eight, nine, especially in the, you know, in, in the summer months. It's quite a vibe and, and you get a lot of very strong shadows and sunlight coming in because I'm very much into light. And um, people, you know, I mean, going to the offices, especially very much this is economy and things moving. And um, unfortunately, again, a lot of homeless people, huh? and unfortunately also a lot of um, African Americans who are homeless in this um, downtown area. So these kind of things. Huh? All the time I'm trying to be open-minded, open-ended about these things. I actually got to know some homeless people. Also got to know some people going to the, working in the offices as well. Huh? So it's, it's all the time, it's a kind of, I, I was, my, personally my own way of working is a give and take. Huh? So I try to Again, um, listening, taking, and at the same time, striving to take, make images. So um, that's very much it, really. I mean, it was, it, I'm constantly learning. I think that's, that's one of the key things in so my way of, of moving is to learn. And, so, and you, it, learning never stops. So it's, it's a constant thing. One thing I must say, though, is that I think one of the key issues which I've noticed of late, of, um, is, is property. Um, one of the worst things um, the Western world has imposed on other parts of the world is private property. So many, many societies before never had actually property. I mean, they, they didn't own the land. It was free. You could build, you know, I mean, in agreement with others in the community and set up. Huh? But now suddenly you have this private property. Huh? And then a, a price... Um, is given to a piece of land, and it, and it just it messes us all up. Huh? So you get things like 
everybody has his own washing machine, has his own property, his own house. There's no, there's no need for many of these things. Huh? And it just messes us up. Huh? And then everybody sounds because that's why you see so many homeless people. They can't afford it. Huh? And then people just walk past the homeless and they don't care for them anymore. It's, it's really very upsetting at times. And then, like, this is why I really admire what you're doing because you're, you're, you're fighting back. It's kind of pushed back. Huh? But still, this thing with property. Huh? Um, would you agree with that, Rashida, in terms of private property? Oh, <laughs> oh definitely, definitely. I mean, properties, um, it, the whole thing is like a time machine in a sense. I mean, when you think about a deed and how it passes down in a very linear sense um, to the next person, to the next person, and um, it's very much tied into colonialism. It's tied, yeah. So when you look at other societies, when you look at um, how indigenous folks, their relationship to the land, there, it's total opposite. There's no, uh, as you just said, no sense of ownership. There's, it's, it's a communal agreement. It's, so yeah, I, I totally agree with that. And, and again, I mean, part of um, the notion behind Community Futures Lab was to try to pull in some of these other ways of, of um, the, the thinking about relationship to space, time, literal, sp you know, physical space, and, and our own times. Because yeah. Well, also ha and I mean, we've had a lot of discussions about owning space. Um, do you see it as significant in relation to, you know, the work that you're doing? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's important to own space. Um, for me, I never worked for anybody, so we've been working within our own spaces. The space that we had, we couldn't control it because, again, it's quite a, uh, it occupies a city block. It's, 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 it, it's tied into political uh, narratives that even their own government can't even, you know, uh, self-sustain or self-fund. So when we moved out, we moved into another space. So this idea of us always having to find a space to practice our thinking, to practice our ideology, also open up to other artists to find studio spaces uh, in various forms. And also, it's not even about owning properties, it's about owning resources, um, um, making access, uh, resources accessible, you know, from uh, film cameras to sound systems to uh, even something as simple as internet. Here might, 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 might be easy f to find Wi-Fi in every single corner, but f in South Africa it's quite a difficult thing. So all these kind of things from owning property to resources is very much important for me. Um, that's why it's always like, how do we, how do we, how do we find a space um, that we can really, you know, uh, paint the walls and the thinking in, our, in how we want to see ourselves in the future, or also how do we educate the young ones to follow in the same footsteps? Because the same, when we talk about this property, it's not, it's not even to be inherited or for us to say that, oh, we own this kind of building. It's a much open-ended building. Anybody can follow in our footsteps and can take over the directorship of our institution when it's stable, when it has its own funding or, or you know, streamline of income. And again, one of the things I want to stress also is like we, 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 we're very uh, proud of ourselves in, in creating a self-sustainable model so we stop writing grants. And then we stop that for, for a while. So right now it's like, how do we approach other institutions? So if we're working with other institutions, it has to be in a more collaborative um, aesthetic rather than us saying, oh, here, here's our proposal, or here's a call out for this, that thing we've bypassed a long time ago. So the, so the level of, 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 of the idea of, of ownership, but also ownership in, in how you get to execute uh, or get to collaborate with other institutions. I'm not saying that we can exist outside of white institutions. That's not, that's, that's not, a, that's not possible, but, but it's like how do you get to engage this white institution? From what kind of power level do you have? Because the same content that we're producing is the same content that is, that's why we're sitting here. It's the same content that is required and needed. That's why it's always interesting that when I say, like, we've been watched, it's always, there's no other way. Blacks are always being watched. So how do we stop that third eye and then focus it on ourselves. So that third eye meaning, you know, the outside world, I mean, the outside, you know, I don't want to go back to the, the whole thing of we've been colonized and all these kind of things. That's a given, that's, that's a standard. So that's what I'm saying. Who are you talking to? In what, way, in what way are you engaging them, those people? So for me, it's like in that level of ownership, it's like how do you also block the outside world from entering this specific space? Because when you say utopia, that means that energy must be far away and then people must be comfortable enough to really you know, discuss from a level of, 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 of like a, this trauma that travels through DNA without being traumatized at the same time by when you look up. You're talking all these kind of sensitive things. When you look up, it's like you know your people are not even there. So it's like always, how how do you get to 
you know, but when you're referring to ownership, spaces. are you talking about collective ownership? Yeah, collective ownership. There's no authorship in our thing. Um, um, it's, it's a collective. Everything is collective ownership. Because then it, it could be how many black black spaces are there? You know, so that one space that is available has to be open to the rest of the community. And then in what way does it develop them to also realize that they could open up another space or engage, you know, how do they get to engage in other spaces? So my importance is like in the level of, 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 of like how do we create these spaces but make them self-sustainable within their own working mechanism without, again, you open up a space. You know, right now I can think of, I can think of a lot of spaces that have closed up. You know, you open a space for a year and then it closes up. You open another space, it closes up. There's so many spaces that have closed up. So how do you sustain a space is very much important. So how do you generate but that kind of income? But when you're relating to spaces, you know? you're relating to property. Yeah, property. Okay, so then in a relation property. to pu public space, yeah. which, is, which, which is, should be collectively owned. Yeah, it's, like, it's, it's as simple as ends to a colony. Ends, they, they go out and source whatever they need to source and they come back to one central central thinking tank. So for me, it's like, then how do we create those central thinking tank? But it's a property, it's, a, it's an infrastructure, it has to be that. If we are outside, then it's, we're never gonna survive or sustain ourselves, because then we'll be exposed to the elements. Um, okay, I'm, yeah. I'm gonna open up to the floor if there are, are any questions. Um, yeah, there's... Is there a microphone or...? Yeah. You mentioned what uh, happened in Philadelphia and the demolition of the, the properties there. I'm not sure if you're aware that happened here in Chicago at Cabrini Green, yeah. which is an enormous uh, uh, project here and completely lost its uh, value. I mean, of course, it gained value because it became very a very wealthy area, but uh, it dispersed so many people, just like you, you mentioned. So do you have any idea? Uh, are you going to do any story about that? Um, I am aware of it. I, I have heard of it. Um, there's a documentary about it that's really, really um, amazing. Uh, I believe it, it might be on Netflix. Um, the Community Futures Lab that's based here in Chicago is not specifically focused on that um, in relationship to kind of how the other Community Futures Lab was specifically about that particular area. This is more um, open space and it's um, meant to be self-activated for folks to come in and, and talk about whatever they wanna talk about in terms of the future of Chicago and the futures of their particular communities in Chicago and, and to get that collective voice um, and, and towards you know an end goal of like, you know within the context of the larger um, BNL gathering those other stories, privileging those other voices that often get left out of these narratives get left out of these decisions about which buildings come down, which buildings remain, who gets access and things like that. Um, so for me, the Community Futures Lab is a way to amplify those voices again. It's not um, saying that we have a solution to, to these things or that there's a, a, um, a, again, a neat bow to kind of tie around these concepts, um, but it's, it's meant to amplify and uncover these voices that, that get left out of these narratives. What happens to those voices? So, so for example, if there is this opportunity for people to talk about how they'd like to see their city transformed or changed, um, is there a potential or a possibility that, that actually those are then used to, um, to change policy? Or is, is there a way of collectively using them to actually make a difference? Yeah, I think so. Um, but that would have that would depend on the direction that folks who have contributed to it want to take it. Um, and again, I wouldn't want to be the one to impose what that looks like. So back in Philly, uh, again, you know, because I was able to spend that time with people and to really build up those relationships and to understand where and how they wanted their voices to be used and to be very meticulous about that and, and to not put out stories that people didn't want to be put out. Um, sometimes people just want to share things for their, you know, their own catharsis or to be able to get it out and not necessarily to be shared or to, you know, kind of referring back to what you're saying. So I, I don't know yet. I don't, 
I don't want to impose that. I don't know what that's going to look like for here because I, I don't have the ability to spend the same amount of time that I did in Philly and to be that careful. So part of that's going to be in conversation with you and, and again, kind of thinking about what the space can generate and activate for itself and where the people who are participating want to take those voices, how they want to use them, how they want to amplify them. Fortunately, I actually do work in Chicago now. My, my job is um, a very similar organization that I work for in Philly called Shriver Center, and they do a lot of advocacy and policy advocacy work. Um, so I will have some connection to be able to feed that and, and help amplify in that direction if that's what, what comes out of it, but I don't want to impose that yet. I have no preconceived notions or set or determination about how, how these stories are going to be used because I want to leave it to the people you know, to, to do that. Okay, we have time for one more. This is um, sort of a statement question, but um, in response to this idea of value and how we determine value, especially around time and space, um, I just wanted to also kind of throw in the mix that uh, Lolly Bowen wrote um, an essay for the Tribune recently, and this in the last week, about CHA, C yeah, CHA Cabrini Green and other residents who come back each year for family reunion picnics. And so thinking about the fact that the narrative is, is around destruction, and yes, there are actual real world concerns about you know, people being dislocated, but the fact is that people have their own value networks around coming together and you know, more to maybe what you were talking about in terms of um, uh, how we meet and our languages that we use to reconnect. And so thinking about those continuing on seems to me something that is not always part of the narrative, um, but that people are creating their own ways of maintaining that kind of, and I'm, so I'm just curious to throw in, you know, go back to that kind of idea around how we qualify or quantify value within all of these questions. Um. Yeah, no, that's a great thought. That's that's perfectly right. So much of the narrative is focused on the trauma, focused on um, you know placing black bodies as this this lack or right, um, all of these sorts of things. And it really is important to amplify um, the the ways that people continue those networks, continue it through loss. Um, like Sharswood, um, a lot of the folks had this really. Um, this, this hashtag called Forever Blumberg. And so that was the name of the buildings that were um, demolished. And so if you go online and you look up Forever Blumberg, you'll see people continuing those networks using that hashtag to show pictures and to share how they're maintaining memories, how they're maintaining friendships and networks despite the, the, the buildings coming down and they're not being that physical location. And like I said, they, they also meet annually and have this, this thing in a neighborhood where it's just dancing and, and everybody sharing resources and things like that. And it's not about you know the, the trauma or the displacement and there's a place to come back to so I, I think you're totally right um, about that and, and yeah just making sure that doesn't get lost and that we're not um, kind of uh, privileging these these narratives about the value of property and gentrification over real lives and real people's stories that differ and that there's there's a lot of layers and a lot of richness um, there that can be you know shared or not, or experienced, and not even necessarily shared out to the larger world, but experienced by people. And we don't necessarily have to name that or, um, you know, have an eye on that or surveil that. Like, it, it, it exists, and, it, and that's, that's it, it exists within itself, so, yeah. I mean, I mean uh, it's quite interesting also, like, how we, like you're saying, outside of trauma, we'll celebrate people still coming back to that side of trauma to show that they've, like, sort of survived, um, because uh, black people, again, we, we, we went through a lot of struggle. We always have this idea that, you know, we've been looked, that's why the concept of being looked at is like, oh, they're still, they're still happy at least, you know? That means if we can push them further again, you know, if we keep, if we keep like, you know, tormenting them constantly, they'll still be fine. Because here they're dancing, here they're doing all their tricks, and you know? So for me, it's like, how do we, like, like, just the idea of, 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 of being looked, is there a way to really turn off of being looked at in that way? And then is there a way to really relook really at ourselves, but also changing the, the lens completely, like these lenses completely, of how, how we always having to celebrate, uh, celebrate the coming, you know, jumping over this hurdle, or now we are, now we are okay. 
but then we still don't have any fundamentality of roots and ground. And then this thing of, okay, demolitions happen constantly, gentrification is taking over, Johannesburg is even crazier right now. But then the inner city, I can't, say, I can't even say black people amongst themselves. Right now, there's a lot of xenophobic, Afrophobia is happening in South Africa, it's crazy. It's amongst ourselves. The same black utopia that we're imagining is the same black people killing themselves. But then to, to, to now to stop really, to really re-look re at our own sort of trauma is still gonna take years and years beyond my generation. Like just to even to overcome why we're killing each other right now in, in Africa is like just you know, dazzling to me. So it's like this, this constant trauma is always gonna be there and constant celebration of our, how we overcome certain things is always gonna be there. It's like part of our existence. That's why I'm crying over the I'm crying over the fact that how do we create spaces that we heal ourselves, like we sown by the black spirit. Sometimes we really, like we vibrate a lot. Like there's this kind of sense of vibration that never really sits us still. That's why time, that's why when you wake up in the morning, it's like you wake up with so much like energy of like, wow, shit, the day is starting. I need to do this. And in South Africa, there's a lot of black techs. That means you have to take care of your cousins, your nephews, your younger brothers. That means when you work, your little paycheck is gonna still gonna be split like five, six, seven ways. So th this thing of being on time never really, you know, it's like there's no time. It's like you're still, you're still in your head thinking about a lot of things things. So that's why if, if, if then for me, that's why I'm, I'm proud, like I never worked for anybody since I graduated. So my thing is like my time is my own time. When I wake up, I know my mission and what I need to do. But then the same mission is like, how do we create more spaces? It's, uh, it's like that track, uh, most deaf when he said, you know, uh, sometimes you just want to stop being a soldier. You just want to be a man, you know, just be free, you know, just like, just live. But then the idea of just living is impossible because you still have to be a soldier at the same time. Because when you walk the street, like my brother was saying, you know, you know, you see a lot of like, you know, like lost souls, you know, I don't know if it's through, obviously lost souls in the sense that they can't afford is homelessness. But at the same time, it's like, you know, lost souls of, of you don't have shit. You don't, sorry, you don't have anything, you know? So my thing is like, it's like it's always a constant frustration that time is non-existent. It's like the now. It's like how do you exist in the now? And then how do you capitalize on the now? But at the same time, this now, how do you really, you know, on, uh, at the same time healing your own self, but how do you heal another person? But you can't do that because you, you yourself, you're all messed up inside. So that's what I'm saying. How do you create spaces that really stop this vibration within the black soul and really just quiets it and then focus it on a more on a more brighter side, but um, like I said, coming from where I come from, it's hard to see the brighter side, and it's hard to see yourself as a man sometimes, because then you still wake up as a soldier the next day, and then you know it's a constant struggle, it's a constant cycle back and forth, unless you just find a nine to five and you just like accept the conditions of what you are in. Uh, but for me, it's like it's, it's that. It's either we we stop and we pause and we stop entertaining these other spaces, we entertain ourselves seriously, we burn sage, whatever we need to do, but we need to talk amongst ourselves and then stop this vibration that is constantly happening. Because the same vibration is what the next generation is born with and the next generation is born with. And there will never be this sort of central uh, unified or central sense of utopia say, oh, we reached it. And Africa supposed to be that utopia for all black people, but it's still not utopia for all black people, even the ones that are originally from there. Well, I'm going to put a full stop on our talk. I wanted to thank you for your time and sharing your inner thoughts. I really appreciate it, where you've come from, and I value the time that you're taking to share with other people here today. Um, I feel as if this is also, for me, something I'm still trying to figure out. So the question mark after Black Utopias was really to say, I don't know if there's something which we can call a black utopia. I don't know if there's something that we can really call black space or black time, but how do we begin to define it or how do we begin to practice it or enact it or to share that? Because I think um, even though we, we're not necessarily talking in terms of dominancies or subordinates or... I've, it's taken me a very long time to realize that... Um, collectively or individually, it's actually sometimes very difficult to recognize what your own voice is and how that might resonate with somebody else. And that resonance is extremely important because it's about our experience within our skin, within the world, and how the world reacts to us. So I think it's important to articulate it, to 
try to put a, a voice on it. Maybe you have to find another language for it. But I, I do believe that it's important to continue to try to define it. So thank you all for coming. If you have the chance, please come to the Chicago Cultural Center, where, um, but also um, Keller Kettler Library's work is off-site at the Jane Addams Homes. Um, I think, Akinbodi, you have work at the Homan Square as well as at the Cultural Center. Um, and I want to thank you all for staying with us this afternoon. Thank you.